While you're enjoying your dinner, we're going to move to the uh, final academic intellectual part of our uh, conference. I am very pleased to reintroduce uh, Laurence Tubiana, who, uh, as I've already mentioned, has affiliation with a number of French institutions on which she started. She is professor at the best French school, Sciences Po. I should have mentioned, but I will mention it now, she's also faculty member at the best American university, <laughs> Columbia. And this must have been put in by the president's office, I think. Uh, and um, so it's a pleasure to have her give the keynote, this is our second keynote speech, the dinner speech. Uh, she will uh, give the speech. We'll have time for uh, some questions and answers, and you can have your dessert and eat it too while she's speaking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. Uh, one, because that's an opportunity to visit my colleagues at Columbia. And uh, even uh, I have feel a little nostalgia not teaching this year, but it's rather incompatible, of course, <laughs> with the program I have to, to really to match. <clears throat> so it's very good, and thank you very much to have invited me for this, for many reasons. One is this pleasure to meet you and having listened at least a very good panel and, and your uh, synthesis, uh, Pascal on Bolton, on, on what has been, uh, Patrick, on what has been said uh, during the day, very, very good. <clears throat> and because I have some demands to make to you. Uh, so... On my view, it's not a free dinner, meaning it's very good what you have done already, but uh, I think you, you have to do a little more before Paris. And that's what I will sort of express myself on. <clears throat> so Patrick said very, very rightly, that exactly he could have uh, stolen my words. Paris will be, the result of Paris, yeah, Paris outcome will be managing expectation, not to lower expectation, but really to share expectation that everyone, the main actors that would be participating, preparing Paris, but the rest of the world as well, <coughs> will s ourselves, and you are part of it, will send converging signals that low carbon economy is bound to deploy. That is, it, will, it, it is an inev inevitable moment, movement, and it is desirable and that the goal of the two degrees C is an organizing principle of action, a reference against which every business, every policy should be assessed and marked. So that is what we have to have on the 12th of December as a communication, not the communication, the result of Paris, is not only a legal agreement, is not about burden sharing, about uh, a carbon budget, is about sending the signal from different areas, different circles, and that we can listen, hear that signal, and that it is understandable, which is a major challenge. And that exactly on what that challenge I would come back. So many of you in the business community, in the financial community, in the local authorities, in the governments, you see many positive movements. For the moment, if I may say so, it's nice noises. It's not a melody. You, you don't understand what is happening. You don't know if it's big, small, transformational, incremental. We have to create that. And not myself will create that, that all of us. So we have to work very hard for the 10 months that are still there to produce this organized message that can everybody understand, the one who would not like to see this low carbon economy, but we should accept that fact, and the ones who are pushing for it. We have to change the political economy of that discussion at global level. <clears throat> so what Paris outcome would look like? Because of this <coughs> global perspective, and it's very new. I think the main innovation, which is here on the table, is that this agreement would not be like any others in the past climate regime. It will not be about a carbon, a budget, a carbon budget sharing, which was a little bit the, the notion implicit in Kyoto. 
it will not be a one mechanism doing the job for everybody, which was, again, the philosophy in Kyoto, to have really a global com carbon market mechanism helping to really uh, reorient partly the economy. So it's a much, much, much complex animal we will produce, which is, which is good because this is a response to many critiques of the climate regime, many elements that said this regime is not efficient, is not producing any results. That's why I think, and uh, that's very interesting for all the professors working on global governance, why this climate regime is trying, making essays and error and try and try to understand better, to create and generate knowledge and information that finally would modify the expectations. <clears throat> so based on that, and, and my thing, I have only one theory to try to see what could be the climate uh, the outcome for Paris, is a theory of rational expectation. So how we create them. So that's why I think we have to have the agreement, a legal text, and with an ambition mechanism built in this agreement. We know already that the first commitments of pledges, like the, what the case in Cancun, Copenhagen, Cancun, would not make it to the global target, which is a reference. So we have to have an agreement that create the discipline for all countries, the rules, the cycles, the obligations, not necessarily the substance of the obligation, or it is a, for example, the numbers, but yes, the obligation nature of the obligation. And this agreement have to build in the ambition how we have cycles, reviews, long-term scenarios, in particular for 2050, that can make this process consistent with what the target is. So that is the first element of the Paris outcome. We have, of course, to have these first pledges, which is the heritage of Copenhagen and Cancun, explicit but was I think a better quality. W why? Just because countries are mo much more prepared. And because now it's not about putting a number, but uh, about describing the policy instrument that any country will use to implement these targets. And the explicit policy signals will be at least at the center of these INDCs. And we show this beginning to be the case. Uh, and that's a discussion we have. Maybe we not have everything by Paris 2015, but the final contribution that would be in a way uh, uh, finalized before the agreement enter into force before 2020, I, I'm sure that this is part of the process that will more and more be explicit about the way the policies instrument will use. That's come back to the discussion we had earlier. Then the financial transition, the finance will be, of course, a key element of the outcome in Paris. It's very central. It's very central because we have to deliver on the pre-2020 100 billion target and to have a credible pathway to get there and to build at the same time a transition before these numbers were really political numbers at that time, a condition of success for Copenhagen and Cancun, and build in the transition to the long-term finance, which is basically the reorientation of the financial system to allow for a viable capital at a reasonable cost to invest in this low-carbon economy. We need at the same time, which I think is quite related to the finance, the technology investment that will make this investment possible. And that an element which I think is very important too. <coughs> the final element we, we, we look for it's uh, having non-state actors committing. And what, what is commitment? It's, in a way, <coughs> revealing the, their plan for the future. What kind of commitments cities would make for after 2020, uh, 2030, in terms of emission reduction, in terms of uh, sectoral plans on transport, on buildings? The same for the state levels. I'm sure, I know we will have them. Now, again, it's a way of organizing the message. <coughs> Businesses, individual commitments, sectoral co uh, engagements, policy on technology that the companies are, are making and, and delivering. So, and, and then we come to, to your group, that's the financial actors, and that's to, today discussion. 
Of course, an increase in the funding available to combat this climate change is, will be a mi major component. <clears throat> and we have this commitment of the 100 billion pre-2020 to support mitigation and adaptation. I think we, we have to be realistic. Nobody will believe that they, they are there. It's not real. They are there partly, but not totally. We have to create and to describe the trajectory. Even if that is good, we have capitalized the Green Climate Fund, which was a very important achievement. Uh, but we now start, and we now have start to deliver concrete investment before Paris, at least. We will try to, and I think it's, it can be done, at least for some projects. <clears throat> but we have to recognize that we certainly can leverage private finance, and that can be acceptable for the whole group of the developing countries if we put some more Finance, public finance in the system, and, there, and we have different ways, and we have been discussing, by the way, good ideas earlier on. <clears throat> so I will just spend a little minute, some minutes on the public finance side. It has a catalytical role to play in leveraging private finance, but still, what is this leverage about? We still don't know exactly. We know that we don't have a number of the leverage capacity. It varies among countries, among sectors. But again, we, we have to be serious about that. We have to know what is leverage, what kind of leverage a country investing can hope, if there is some public finance coming from the international sources, how much reasonable private funding would come. So we need a lot of work uh, before Paris to clarify this relation, not just to account things but really to clarify this relation between public finance and the leverage of leveraging of the private financing. I think, of course, this is not about the long-term finance. That is much bigger. But again, it's a question of credibility. So we have to deliver this by Paris. <clears throat> How we do that? I think we have to, that the, the whole elements of the financial system has to produce this signal. Globally, what we are looking for is a reallocation of investment, in particular in infrastructure, uh, towards this low carbon and resilient economy. Uh, but for this, uh, I think we need that everyone takes its part. How we increase the role of the, MD in a way, starting from the national domestic capacity of investing, why we were commenting that with uh, a colleague from India uh, uh, during the drinks, banks in India, that's the same in China, does not easily finance renewable energy or energy efficiency, is that even worse? Why, because they don't know exactly what is this about? What are kind of, is this too risky? The identification of the project, that's where international public finance can help a lot, this domestic financial resources to be oriented to this low carbon economy, meaning that MDBs have to do much more than what they do today. That's beginning by the big one, the World Bank, but the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank has to mobilize the balance sheet to do more, to be really ready to identify the project, to, to help identify and really reducing the risk. So with potentially innovating financial instrument as well, but to play that role that yes, this is financeable, and, uh, and we know what it is. It's not a strange animal. It's, it's a really the normal economy. That's just a new normal economy. And I do think, and that will be what we will try on the 31 of March in Paris, starting there and going beyond, uh, demand to the MDBs to be more proactive on that. So that's my first demand. MDB should deliver more finance for the low carbon economy. So has the national, develop, the national development banks and the commercial banks in the countries can, can go there, can be confident to go there. Then we have, of course, others that has to, to be mobilized as well. And, uh, sorry. Uh, you have been, in particular, yourself uh, showing a, a lead 
you have been a leadership. Institutional investors, pension funds, insurers, and I remain. I remember a discussion two years ago, I think, or three years ago, with Frederic, and uh, I was not sure he could deliver that. So bravo, you you did that with your colleagues here, and uh, and it's really amazing what what is happening. So really, this decarbonization, the idea of decarbonization, the portfolio is a major major idea, and but of course that has. It's not only disinvestment, is now to go to uh, funding uh, the long-term investment infrastructure, match the liabilities, if, of course, the public finance has showed some leadership to do it. If not, the pension fund would not go there because it would not know what to finance and it is, is really reasonable to go there. So it's not about only disin disinvestment, it's about reinvesting with proper condition to do so. That's why the authorities, the global financial authority, have a responsibility to, because they have to, they have beginning to deepen their analysis of the financial risk associated with climate change. Uh, of course, the governors of the uh, UK central bank has been very vocal on that, and we thank, we have to thank him for that, because he introduced uh, in a taboo, a tab to, to really to break a taboo in these uh, very close circles. But the, the central bankers have to do more. They have to consider, is it really or not? They, they, there are obstacles on the financial regulation that really prevent the long-term investment to take place. And I think some, some central banks are showing leadership, and we, they will have to say something for Paris and before Paris. So rating agencies, of course, still timid. Standards and poor has come forward saying they will factor in climate risk in the evaluation, <coughs> but of course uh, we still have a lot to work to. I very ambitious commitment have been made in the climate summit and uh, my colleague in the UNSG team has done an enormous work to do that together with you and it's very good and I think they will help mobilizing even more. And I salute the work of this portfolio decarbonization portfolio coalition and AP4, Amundi, CDP, UNEPFI, all the work have been done. It's very important. And of course, I encourage the ones who have not joined the coalition to join in immediately before it's only 10 months and you have to prepare for that. <coughs> but I have a little more demands to make to you. Uh, I know that the coalition is uh, tracked to meet the commitments by the COP21 and, and maybe uh, enhance them by and going beyond the 100 million, billion. Uh, but I would like us to reflect together on this, the sign, how we can express this signal to the outside world. What is a threshold that will make a difference? We know that it is not the 100 billion. It's more. How will we communicate the fact that decarbonization portfolio is now really showing that there is a risk in the high carbon? Uh, can we begin to think about what would be the indicator? Uh, a journalist, a Wall Street journalist, yes, he was in Washington three or, three or four days ago, uh, told me, I understand you see Paris not a, a, as an end point, it's a turning point, so what is important is what it will be done after. So what is your, how you qualify your turning point? I would like to, you to respond to, in your understanding of your activity, what is the sign indicator of the turning point. And, and we have to think about that before Paris to communicate that to the people. So more engagement in the coalition, more thinking about what the threshold is about, and think of, you are investors as well, and of course you will not shift all your portfolio, not all of you, uh, but the ones who would keep a foot in the high carbon, what, what you will say to the companies? Can you, for example, like some commercial banks want to do, engage with the companies to do better and ask them to do better and commit to a deep decarbonization pathway compatible with the 2 degree C, not of course for today, but as a perspective? Uh, we can use uh, disinvestment or investment in a different forms. It's different business model for different funds, but we have to have this convergence signal going in the same direction. So let's talk about not only the coalition of the decarbonization of the portfolio, but 
speak about the other ones or how they influence but being shareholders the companies in which they are coming and ask them what is your commitment how, how is your scenario to be in a world well low carbon economy will be the mainstream economy i think and we talk about that we need to to mobilize the, the finance from the south and uh, it's a tough job I don't think it's a totally impossible one because, again, it's global economy, it's global finance. So once we have this threshold, once we have these indicators, I think the other banks would do the same. They would not do something totally different. So it's very much is very important to reach out to them to s begin discussing uh, with these banks, and uh, I think that part of the particular MDB's work to do to their counterparts, the BRICS bank and the infrastructure bank that, to China, that China has created. Really, we need this institutional fi finance, public finance to talk and to really uh, adjust that benchmark. Uh, uh, I've been talking with the Asian Development Bank and others, really a lot is to be done still. Final word on adaptation. Uh, we need the private sector to do more. It's not easy. I think that uh, Vikram said, there is no business case, but sometimes there is business case. And insurance for agriculture, for example. Uh, infrastructure, you, if you are protected, you can pay for it in some cases. Water management, you can have some kind of business model behind it. So we, we can have elements, not all adaptation. It's not all adaptation is public finance. It's some part can be, we can find a business model here, and some part, of course, I think health, for example, is strictly... Uh, an, an impact and a cost. So what is uh, the, uh, the, the way we see things? Uh, several milestones. So first March, end of March was public finance and then the April meeting where we will push for MDBs to take commitments before Paris in clear terms. <coughs> and having the private finance organized maybe at some points uh, uh, we are looking for an occasion where all this coalition can grow and you can have more members and more uh, working with the different facet of this, uh, of these uh, coalitions or these investors. And then to have in October, in the margin of the annual meetings, probably after the meeting, invited by Peru, France, and maybe the, the UNSD, uh, a meeting where we gathered all these elements from the uh, the support of the national development finance, the multilateral development finance and ODA, and the private finance, a reasonable package that can be understood by all. Should we have case studies where we can demonstrate practically to developing countries that this is, will be the way they would finance Ethiopia, the major geothermal uh, facilities they would like to, or whatever, I was thinking about Nicaragua and the renewable energy because they, they try to assemble private and public funding. We have to demonstrate the reality of this because there is still a lot of distrust of this. But globally, I think we can build up together this message that that is a new economy we are building. We believe in it. We have plans. We have investments. We have economic decisions, and we know where we are going. So that's why I think we have to organize our message. So my last demand is we have to produce this message collectively. It's not there. But everybody is really willing to help and to support, but then we, we have to organize this between us for the rest of the world to understand what we are doing. And for the rest of the world, we understand that Paris is not about a treaty, it's about a signal of the transformation of the economy. Thank you.